Good morning, um, Abdullah Sarkar, cardiology fellow at Cleveland Clinic, Florida. And good morning, I'm Nino Sukadze, first year EP fellow at Johns Hopkins. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Atul Verma, who is joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. Definitely. So Dr. Verma, of course, uh, you're very well known in the EP community and in the general cardiology community for obviously your work, your training, and obviously your research. And now with the pulse field ablation. But I wanted to take a step back and, you know, I'm sure that you do look back and we all kind of started somewhere. And for us who are trying to get to that kind of platform, I wanted to ask you, what started all of this? Was it back in high school or was it back, you know, we were just talking about how, you know, other people who both ended up in EP. But was it institution, a mentor or your own kind of fire that brought you into all of this? I think it's obviously a combination of a lot of things, but it really uh, became apparent for me during my EP fellowship. Uh, I'd always been interested in doing some research, uh, but when I went to my fellowship at the time between 2003-2005, it was the early days of complex ablation, literally everything we were doing was publishable. And so at that point, I just got addicted, quite frankly, and I started picking up data left, right, and center. I started publishing it. And then when you get that self-reinforcement that you can do this, uh, it kind of becomes baked in the bread. And so after I left, I just continued publishing and uh, just tried to stay as involved as I could. Definitely. Sounds like you got some inspiration and stayed persistent. Great. And just to follow up on that, we all know that you know, running the clinical trial and being a principal investigator is requiring a lot of skill set. And it's a little bit different skill set than maybe other types of research, such as basic or translational. So what are your kind of what were your um, what was your experience on getting those skill set? Yeah, so I think uh, you're right. Clinical trials is a lot of work. It's a lot of patience. And uh, most of the work actually has to be done before the trial in terms of proper planning, design, etc. So definitely some training in that respect, uh, clinical epidemiology, trial design. There are a lot of different courses that can be done, uh, formal master degrees. Uh, but I think uh, experience at the end of the day is really what you need. So in the beginning, you know, I just tried to get myself involved. Even if I was on, uh, you know, an events adjudication committee mm -hmm. or some small committee in a trial, you get a really good sense of how this stuff is done. And then you just take the leap and, and you try and ask a clinically relevant question and, and you go for it. That's awesome. Sounds like you stayed involved and that experience really helped you. Well, we have this opportunity to have you here, so we obviously have to ask you about the clinical trial that's coming out tomorrow, and uh, I'll pass it on. Yeah, absolutely. Can you share kind of some take-home points uh, from the trial, and what do you think about um, the change, in, like, are we changing the field in terms of uh, AFib ablation? Yeah, so uh, I think uh, this trial are the results of the pivotal pulsed AF trial, and what's different about this trial is we're using a new technology for catheter ablation. So traditionally, we've ablated tissue either by burning it with radiofrequency or freezing it with cryothermy. It's great, it's worked for many, many years, but there are also potential collateral damage that we can do to the phrenic nerve, causing phrenic nerve palsy, the esophagus, causing an esophageal fistula, which can be fatal. So obviously, these are things that are very undesirable. Plus, when you're heating or burning to uh, freezing tissue, it takes time, right? It, it, you, you have to stay in the same place for several seconds or minutes. Uh, pulse field ablation, I think, has the ability to really transform our field because it's ablating the tissue through electroporation, which means that we use high-intensity, short-duration electrical fields to literally electrocute the tissue you hyperpermeabilize the cells, and then they eventually die. Uh, as it turns out, however, myocardial cells are very sensitive to pulse fields, 
whereas it's very hard to ablate esophagus and phrenic nerve with pulse field. So we think it's going to be safer by minimizing collateral damage. And you can also deliver these pulses in a fraction of a second. So it can be much, much faster. Great. And uh, it's, we are all excited um, for this to kind of launch and you know, be scaled across the you know, world. Uh, but what do you anticipate as potential pitfalls of the PFA? Yeah, so uh, I think the one pitfall we have found is that depending on where you're ablating, especially if it's close to a coronary artery, it can cause coronary vasospasm. Okay. And that tends to be when you're on the cavotricuspid isthmus or the mitral isthmus. However, when you're ablating elsewhere in the left atrium, it's actually very hard to cause this coronary vasospasm. So I think that's something we have to work on and is probably so far the, the only major pitfall of this technology. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing those insights. And just one last question. Any specific um, challenges being a new technology? You know, I remember, you know, when you write a literature review, there's nothing to go off on. So what were any specific challenges having a new technology in the market, new studies coming up? Yeah, so, you know, as, as you'll see from the results tomorrow, this was a single arm study, and we tried to compare it to old benchmarks of success. And uh, I think what you'll see tomorrow is that, first of all, we clearly demonstrated the safety of okay. the technology. Uh, the complication rate was less than 1%. It's one of the lowest complication rates ever reported in an AF ablation trial in the literature. Uh, the success rates were at least equivalent to thermal ablation. And the timing, uh, these procedures were about an hour or less. So, uh, you know, I think very exciting data. That's really exciting to hear about the safety and uh, effectiveness. What is the, like, do you anticipate the longer term durability of the um, lesions? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. So far, I think that the lesion depths and the durability seems to be equivalent to thermal. So I think, uh, now remember, thermal has had nearly 25 years to perfect itself. And this is the first generation of PFA technology. So if we can get the same result as thermal, but much faster and much safer, I think it's a win. Uh, but I think to get better efficacy, uh, we're going to have to wait for Gen 2, Gen 3, Gen 4, and, and, and so on. And, and that'll be another uh, five to ten year journey. Definitely. And I'm sure you'll be leading that. And um, we'd love to chat with you uh, all day, but we have a short time. So thank you so much for your time. No, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for sharing the results. Thank you. All right.